Hello, I'm Hi. Peter Knox. This is Martin St. John Aka Jugs, aka Jugs, the Jugs of Hazard, <laughs> as you got falsely advertised in. Um, a bit of advertising or something, was it? And the media, they called you, uh, it was Jukes rather than. Yeah, right, so it was I, that was in some dodgy, what was that? Tour programme brochure or something like that. So it was the end of the tour, right? And that was that a just, primal scream tour? That was it, that was the last mini primal scream tour, right? Yeah. That was the final one that I did the primal scream, really, you know, I. So you were in primal scream, uh, was it 80. 84, well, I really joined in 84 to 84 87, to really. three crucial reels of the early days, like, you know. Eh? And you've written a book about it. Aye, sure have. Uh, but what's the story before that? How did you um, first get into music? Because in the book you're talking about your love of the cramps and all these cool bands. Uh, how did that sort of, uh, what got you interested in the decent music? Well, probably growing up in the 70s, really getting into glam rock, really, wasn't it? But then again, everyone... In the seventies was into glam rock really, you know, so you were like a kid and you just started watching top reports. But nineteen seventy, probably my first memory of music really. And I seen Desmond Decker in Top Reports, you know, black and white telly, he had the white suit on, squinty mouth dancing, singing about the Israelites, you know. That sort of grabbed my attention and then all of a sudden along came Mark Bowling and T Rex. A couple of months later with Ride the White Swan, you know, and I'm thinking, Well, I would like to look at this character like, you know, I so yeah, I just started buying up singles, but before that, I think I bought, before I even bought a single, I actually bought a t-shirt transfer. Right. I was really getting right into Mark Bowling, like, you know, I saw T-Rex, so across the road they had a kind of record shop stroke transfer t-shirt place, like, you know, so I bought a transfer, bought a white t-shirt for a pound, went home and transferred this big bushy corkscrew hairdo and this white t-shirt, you know, and the first thing my dad says, that fella looks as though he's got nits. And I'm like, cheers all, man. <laughs> he just totally blew my cool, you know what I mean? Because yeah. <laughs> it was a bit of a nit epidemic in the early 70s in Glasgow, <laughs> you know? And my old man didn't really give a shit about T-Rex or Mark Bowling, really, you know? So uh, that was it. My first love was T-Rex. So did they go man. like T-Rex, Bowie, and then like back to Lou Reed, Velvets, and then and that kind of Andy Warhol really. direction? Or? Definitely not. No, I went for like T-Rex to like... Around 1975, not really much happened in the music scene, you know. I was really more into muscle about buying singles. I love buying singles. Not the Barris and bought the ex-jukebox singles, free for a pound, really, you know. Quite cheap, not a lot of money, really, going to the football, you know. So, But it was probably around 1975 I started buying albums, you know, like Changes 1, you know, Roll Golds, Rolling Stones, and obviously I loved the first Beatles album, Please Please Me. It was actually one of my favourite all-time albums of the early days, like, you know, the first Beatles album, mm-hmm. you know, so, but it wasn't really until punk came along that it was when I started buying a lot more albums, you know, and obviously then I still kicked in with the seven-inch singles because they were so colourful, like, you know, but probably getting into the dams, you know, Dam, 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 The Clash, you know, Stranglers, you know, Buzzcocks, The Jam, mm-hmm. all that stuff really got me heading down that kind of yellow brick road path really you know definitely yeah. and was yeah. it the same for a lot of your pals or no really no kind of I just went off on my way. own tangent to, to completely I just broke away free from my mates about when I was about 15 when I left school in 1977 like you know mm-hmm. so and I'm thinking wander about the streets and I'm thinking there's nothing really interesting me here you know, looking in shop windows and I'm thinking I need some some new kind of kit, really, you know. I just sort of went into, there was this record shop in Queen Street called Graffiti Records at the time, you know. So I just, uh, I just checked out all the punk sleeves. I think, wow, that looks quite exciting, you know. I went in and I talked to the guy. I said, hey, I'll have a jam single, you know, it looks really good. And I was like, I'll have that Buzzcock single, you know. He's like, yeah, and I took him home and thought, wow, this is the stuff. And it's like God Save the Queen came out. And I'm thinking, I'm having some of that as well. Like the Sex Pistols is really a main catalyst, you know. See, we're in the music papers all the time, like, you know, short corner Sex Pistols, you know, taking over the world, punk rock and all this, like, you know. So uh, I really kind of broke away for all my mates, really, to tell you the truth. And I just went down my own path and I just started going to gigs myself and hanging out, meeting people in record shops, swapping badges, buying records, you know, and meeting lots of different interesting people who are into really different kind of music, you know, and it was a really exciting time, you know. You're mostly hanging out in record shops on a Saturday afternoon, mm-hmm. finding new pals, going to a party that night. You're probably too young to get into pubs, you know, so you hung about in cafes and things like that, you know, drifting about a city centre, then you get to hear of things, you know, 
maybe punk parties or something like that, or maybe a pub that let punks in, you know, I so you'd maybe go over there and hide out, you know, so uh, that was really the music scene up till about 1977, really, you know. And fast forward a few years, where did you find yourself? Um, you're now in Primal Scream, how did that come about? 1980, well, probably I would say the tail end of 1983, I'd went on a holiday to the south of France in 1983, wasn't really much going on musically, like, you know, and I came back in the autumn and uh, started picking up on the seats, picked up on this album, the seats, and then I started picking up on Pink Floyd, Kit Papers at the Gates of Dawn, you know, and I bumped into my wee mate, who wasn't really into that kind of music, and he says, oh, I've bumped into this guy, going to work, man, you know, it's like Bobby Gillespie, I was like, oh, right, him, eh? It's not well, uh, he's into all that sort of same psychedelic pish music you like, you like, you know, I was like, all right, eh? that's not like me, this did, man, eh? So within a month, we met up, started hanging out with each other, really, you know, busy mates. Then through Bob G, we met Beatty. And Beatty's house in the Mount Florida area really became the main hangout for just going there, like buying albums, going back, hanging out, big Beatty skiving off work. I think I was uh, in a shitey wee job in Brighton at the time, in a bottling plant, you know, really soul destroying job. Bob G was an apprentice that he hated, you know. Beatty was an apprentice architect. And we all pretty much bored with crappy jobs, you know, we just kind of drifted towards each other, started buying this kind of music, Buds, Love, Seeds, and then all of a sudden I just found out they had a band together, like, you know. So you weren't a musician at this point? You, were you not, playing anything? Certainly not, no, I was not a musician, no hopes of being a musician, enough. I'm just a record lover, you know, really, uh-huh. a music idiot, really, yeah, you know, so we uh, started rehearsing around probably this summer. So did you just say, hold on a minute? There's a wee gap here for a tambourine. Could say that. They were just looking at all the sleeves and they, they were talking about the band and the other guys in the band who hadn't even met then. Hadn't met Tam McGuck, the drummer, or Robert Young really until a couple of months later, really. You know, just mostly hanging out with Bobby Gillespie. Let's see, Bobby Gillespie, Jim Beatty, and Paul Hart as well was on the scene. And the two Pauls, Paul McNeil. Paul Hart eventually ended up being a guitar player a year later but he was just kind of one of Bob G's pals as well for casting up like and Bob and Paul McNeil so they two were kind of like hanging out together mostly hanging out with these four guys characters really you know so uh, we were looking at all the sleeves and they said look we are getting a wee band together you know and I said oh geez have you listened to what you sound like you know I was like oh I like the sound this set of sounds budsy like that yeah that's the sort of way we're going I was like right eh he says, there could be a room there for a maraca shaker, tambourine guy, I thought, put me in, man, aye, because I ain't no musician, ain't we playing guitar or drums, that's for sure. Aye, so uh, that's how it really kicked in, the rehearsals. Mostly rehearsing in Tam's mum's house and, what was that, uh, Penny Lee. As we started doing the rehearsals in Tam's mum's house, Tam would have shuffled drums, like, you know, and guitars were out. Then we started booking some serious rehearsals in Hellfire Studios in the West End, you know, and all of a sudden made a gig, you know, so it all built up towards this gig in the venue. And by that time, you know, we'd all met Jesus and the Mary Chain, Bobby Gillespie, got a tape off some guy. We'd all been listening to that, thinking, that sounds really good, sounds kind of different. You know, so all of a sudden, we, and McGee came on the scene, you know, and he had his record label at the time as well, like Creation Records. So, but uh, before we, I think we'd even gotten around to playing our first gig, Jim Beatty had already had a song called The Orchard, but he seemed to have, which had Judith, his girlfriend, and vocals at the time, you know. I think this was even maybe before Bobby Gillespie joined on vocals, like, you know. But he didn't really particularly like it, I think he just ended up destroying the tape, like, you know. So I think that was meant to be an early release on Creation Writers, but it just got totally shelved, yeah. you know. So that, that could have been an early single around summer 84, but at that time Creation Records were, uh, you know, up and running, like, you know, cause I think he started around maybe late 82, 83, so he still had the pastels and things like that, doing records, Jasmine Minx, you know. So it uh, all really built up, really, to that first gig in the venue. You know, like Primal Scream, G's and the Mary Chain, those teenage upstarts as well, like Meet Whiplash, Oka 5, Grant Morrison's band. He always was always in kind of moddy 60s power pop bands, like, you know. This was his latest one, Oka 5, like, you know. Can't remember a damn thing about <laughs> You know, McGee's band played yeah. that night as well. Biff Bank Bow, you know, so... Uh, There's so many bands from around that time that are all kind of gone on to like be sort of quite big names 
Was, there, was everyone in a band at that time in Glasgow? Is that? It seemed like it, didn't it? Ah, you know, there was a lot. Was a lot of music kicking about at the time, really. Like you know, uh-huh. you still had the past. Those Strawberry Switchblade, you know, Prime Evils, uh, James King, the Lawns, well, Sophisticated Boom Boom. You know, he says that's a quite a few wee bands on the scene. They were really good live bands, you know. I mean, all the Edinburgh bands like the Visitors, Joseph K, you know, Delmonicals, you know, and stuff like that, really kicking in as well. And the Fire Engines, they were all great bands to see, like you know, and you had places like the Glasgow Tech, Night Moves. These were the sort of two main venues and loads of wee sort of pubs as well. Maybe like Joanna's was a sort of disco nightclub off Sucky Hall Street. That seemed to be our main place where postcard bands used to play as well. Like your Joanna's, Mayfair, your Daddy Warbucks, which was, uh, what was that before Daddy Warbucks? It was called something else. Some other gangster name as well, like, you know. But I can't even remember. I nearly got it there. Let's see, because Primal Scream played in it before it was called Daddy Gigi's. <laughs> that was it, Gigi's. How could I forget, really? It's like an Italian restaurant. <laughs> I know. But I think this guy was obsessed with films, because Daddy Warbucks was a character out of uh, Little Annie Orphan. It was it Little Orphan Annie or something, you know? All right. So he went from Gigi's to Daddy Warbucks, you know? So uh, that was it. It was all happening really around then. It was a really right place, right time, right records. And obviously the record fairs had kicked in as well, like, you know? They were the main place to really go get your music because most mainstream record shops and even indie ones didn't really have a lot of 60s garage punk stuff and stuff mm-hmm. like that you know along with your Lee Hazelwoods and Tim Buckley's and Scott Walker's and all that you know it was all still quite underground you know so you really had to go to these places to get it and then find out where they got it from you know distributors yeah I think do you think YouTube's taking the place of that now? I mean, you can sort of find anything you want, really, can't that you? That is quite sad. YouTube has taken over on eBay, isn't it? The internet, really, yeah. aye, definitely. It's sort of it's sad, killed that off, aye. It's handy as well. Uh, very handy. I, I do it myself. Everyone does it, you know, aye. It's too handy you know? in that sometimes you're late for work or you're up till <laughs> three in the morning or something yeah, like totally that. Yeah, totally. Amazon, one click, you lap, one click, that's it. I get it the next day, two uh-huh. days, you know. So it does kill a bit of the fun and actually get out and meet people, bumping into people and talking, really, mm. you know. So, uh, I remember trying to get the first uh, Spaceman, um, not the first one, but uh, yeah. Perfect Prescription by Spaceman 3. Uh, it took me about four years to get it, and then <laughs> uh-huh. eBay was invented. And yeah. <laughs> Buying up, is that uh-huh. one? Ah, yeah. That? It's other one. Music, I mean, there's so many places now you can get these things, you know, but back then it was just record shops, record fairs, that was it, really. I made an advert in a couple of magazines and send away to some shop in London they'll get you like you know so uh, mm-hmm. but I suppose it was more fun really back then like you know I definitely definitely more fun but now you're just doing it on your own really you know I plus then you were making up compilation cassette tapes as well which is pretty good fun like you know I you know so uh, yeah, I always yeah. get pulled up for like stopping the record near the end and Bobby Gillespie always said how come you always stop this record near the end because like, I get bored <laughs> I get bored with the end and he's like stop doing that I was like but I get bored when you're in that sort of crappy bit goes on and on he's like you're not meant to do that you're meant to just let the record fade out I was like alright <laughs> sound annoying <laughs> I know it does doesn't it when I was making up compilations I had to, huh? to have a load of short songs in my head because if huh? you've got like a wee minute at the end you're like no there's, there's room for a wee you actually timed it oh yeah I never really <laughs> timed it too good man it was just pure random uh-huh, no, total random so- I don't only thing I've ever been organised about. <laughs> ah, right, yeah. But I did used to like making up compilations. Like, there was one cracker I used to make up for Stuart when I used to come over. They were called Uppers and Downers. It was like he would come over to mine for the weekend, you know. So for like going out, we'd be like, compile Uppers, you know. It was just like whoosh, upbeat tracks, bang it out. Coming back, came, he'd be lying there like, oh, oh this is brilliant, this is Downers now, man. I, this is sending me to sleep. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to yeah. talk too much about your great stuff in the book because it's yeah. full of amazing stories and um, it's really very readable. I'd like to ask you a wee bit about the process of... Um, like, when did you first decide to write the book? Because we say you're maybe not really a musician, but you're definitely an author. It's like you found yeah. some maybe latent... Uh, you know, a gift or... Right. I, don't, I, I don't know about that. I, I mean, you've like written it in a... It's, it's quite a sort of street style. It's yeah. really uniquely... Um, you, you tell us... Uh, it's just... The book is really just written the way I speak, really, to tell you the truth. That's yeah. what I think, you know. I'm just trying to get that down, written down. is quite hard in a way, without it turning into total slang. And uh-huh. not everyone understands, you know, but... 
the book is, I must admit, I've gotten feedback from people all over in sort of places like Australia and Italy, and for all that, loving this book, man, I was like, right, that's pretty good, man, it's sort of getting out there in America, Canada, you know, so there is odd copy flying out to these obscure wee places, uh-huh. and so far I've just been getting really good vibes about the whole thing, like, you know, apart from some typo mistakes and some uh, errors with song titles, which right. really could have done with some... Uh, you know, definitely someone looked over and said, mate, it's not this, what was it, this handsome man, it's this charming man, you know, <laughs> a couple of wee things like that, you know, that people have brought up, like, you know, but uh, it is my first time attempt at a book, you know, and luckily I had to have a lot of photographs from that period as well, mm-hmm. which I kept, you know, memorabilia, I mostly kept some of the memorabilia, you know, so uh, I'd say the idea for the book probably kicked in about 20 years ago, I actually started writing down the book. Right. I would say up to about 35 pages I got, and I'm thinking, it's definitely a book here, and I've written down all these chapters and titles, I thought, but now's not the right time to do it, you know, I was probably still quite bitter, I would have came across a very nasty piece of work, mm-hmm. it really would have, you know, and I'm thinking, I don't really want it to be like that, you know, so I kind of just drifted away from it, yeah. and it was only when I was in a pub a couple of months ago, talking to Jackie Henry, this lassie, we were talking about Creation Times, Primal Scheme, we were talking about stories, she's like, you've got some good stories, I mean, you should write your own book, and I was like that. Then it cropped up, that wee light bulb went off, and I think, yeah, maybe now is the right time, really, you know, but uh-huh. this was about three, four years ago, you know. So then I started doing a bit of research, a bit of digging, getting into my 40 albums, went back to the 35 pages around, and I'm thinking, oh, all right, I've started it, I could definitely finish it, you know. Mm-hmm. So when I started contacting some people as well, and they had some of these stories, I thought, yeah, I'm going to piece all this together here. Try and write it, see how it turns out. Done a few chapters, I thought, yep, yeah, it's sort of coming together, like, you know. So uh, uh, it was probably just the right time a couple of years ago, and I thought it was probably came across more humorous now as well, mm-hmm. instead of just a really nasty, non-humorous, horrible crappy piece of work really it probably yeah. would have been turned out 20 years ago maybe because eh? it did you know? sort of end kind of pretty badly um, uh-huh. your relationship with the band yeah. um, but a lifetime's a long time to be annoyed with people I know. that That's does it. come across that life is too goddamn short man you've just got to get over it you really have like you know but it's good to get a different viewpoint of what really happened back then because I have seen, you know, books about creation, books about Jesus and Mary Chain, you know, books about Alan McGee, and I'm thinking, they're obviously second-hand, because they're not really telling the truth. Yeah. You know, it's sort of like a second-hand version of someone who wasn't there, you know, which is interesting in one sort of perspective, but in a way, I like to hear the juicy details, you know, mm-hmm. eh? even though sometimes those people don't actually tell the juicy details themselves, like, you know, if you read Johnny Rotten's or Iggy Pop's biography, you know, Whereas you read someone like maybe Pauline Black, you know, Black by Design, her by and thinking, that's more like it. She's telling it like it is. You know, Vil- Viv Albertine, Albertine as well. Book, and yeah. Ja Wobbles is a cracker. Is you right? know, Memoirs of a Geezer. Yeah. <laughs> what what a great book that is. Right. It's really written in the heart and soul. I'm thinking, that's more interesting than Johnny Rotten's book. You know what I mean? Both his books combined together. It's mm. the Ja Wobble one. Memoirs of a Geezer and the Viv Albertine. She tells it pretty straight as well and goes right into the heart and soul of the stories. I quite like kind of truth-seeking books like that, you know. Uh-huh. Cut across for... Cut out the crap really and just get to it you know it bring you into the scene the times what really happened like you know I think you can tell you are being very honest in the book because you're not just you know you're quite harsh on yourself or what seems honest uh-huh. Um were you ever like nervous about putting some stuff in like oh someone's going to be annoyed there was a here. few things like you know I probably had to leave out definitely uh, you know whatever so we say different kind of nature and I think that's probably just a wee bit too much you know uh-huh. so I had to keep some back you know but most of it what really well everything's the truth in the book there's not one myth or legend it all happened in that book really mm-hmm. you know so uh, it is 90% of what happened is in that book really yeah. it's not just mm-hmm. a book about uh, you and Primal Scream so there's it's kind of like a history of uh, the times as well uh-huh. I'd say that you could certainly get a lot from it even if you're not interested in Primal Scream um, it's kind of a historical document at Glasgow yeah. and cool stuff that you were into. Uh, there's more to it than, you know, yeah. you know, day 54 on the road or whatever. It's yeah, got I know a, what you mean. Yeah. It's got a lot of scope, I think. Yeah. Uh, so it's called Psychedelic Confessions of a Primal Screamer. Yeah. Uh, how how can people get their hands on it if they want to read it? Well, it's, in, it's actually should. on, yeah, it's definitely on lulu.com. That's where to buy the book, definitely, yeah. 
because uh, that's the website that's distributing the book. You know, as an independent book, you know, I've did it all myself, paid for all the costs, you know, so now it's on lulu.com. And uh, to tell you the truth, it's probably the first time ever that a tambourine man's ever written a book ever. <laughs> that's why I did put in it. The tambourine years, it was meant to be a bit of a laughing in joke, you know, because uh-huh. most of everyone that writes a book is either a, the lead singer, you know, the drummer, even the bass player, even the organ player, you know, and Nico's book, what was it, uh, Songs You Don't Hear on the Radio Anymore. It's a great oh, book of this right. guy. I'm sure he was just an organ player, but he hung about with Nico's backing band for three years, and he's written one of the best rock and roll biographies ever, man. I'm like, wow, what a book. And who the hell knows... Nichols, you know, organ player of, say, the mid and late 80s period. No, no. So it's amazing. You don't even have to be the lead singer, the drummer, the bass player to actually write a book. As long as you're there, you're involved, you've got a good story to tell. You know, so... No, uh, you certainly do. I've, I've read that. I've not actually read it, but I've came across this guy's at Will Carruthers out of Space Man 3. Oh, He's yeah. He's written his book as well, hasn't he? Eh? It yeah, sounds yeah. quite good. It's been getting a lot of... You know, good write ups, I think. Oh, that's maybe on the old agenda as well at some point. I mean, get a hold of that. Yeah, get that. You know, uh, I do like reading different kind of books. Like, you know, there was another guy through writing this book, a guy from America got in contact as well. Was it Ben Vendetta, right? Oh, nice. And he'd written a book as well called Within Ho Park, I think it was, aye. Let me I'll dig this wee book out. This is a really good wee book as well. It sort of ties in with my book. That's just coming from an American perspective, like, huh? Got it, huh? Let's see, yeah. what's this, huh? That's it, huh? Yeah. Wivenhoe Park, Ben Vendetta. And this guy was getting into this kind of... He is an American guy, but he was getting into this kind of Brit indie stuff as well in the mid-80s. All this right. is a really good wee book, and he sent me that. And it's full of stories of, like, him coming from America and meeting up with... I don't know if it's fictional or true, but meeting up with Bobby Gillespie and McGee and going to see, you know, bands in London at the time. You know, Hall Park. It's a great wee book. Worth checking. Yep, that's another wee book. Okay. You can get that on Amazon, like, you know. Eh? Can so, we uh, have a wee swatch in the tambourine? Aye, as definitely, well. mate. Aye, yep, aye. This is the case. This is you the were case getting used through to the tambourines, weren't you? you well, were I kept the hell smashing all of the time, you know, so I uh, had to get. Well, luckily, Paul Hart was in the band at the time. They worked in the local garage as a kind of a uh, fitter, like, you know, I. Uh-huh. You know, he was doing buses and all that stuff, you know. And he's like, I can make you a tambourine. I was like, can you? He's like, yep, OK, well, you go ahead and make me a tambourine. He never only really made me a tambourine, he made me a tambourine case as well, like, you know. And Bob G's like, I'll put a wee bit of old uh, suicide stuff on it, you know. I was like, excellent, you know. So printing skills. I Bob G's brilliant, man, with the old handiwork, definitely. But then I started hanging about, getting up, picking up all these wee kind of uh, things that ended up in, was it, toilet, was it? Phone booths are these wee sort of stickers, like you know, Naughty so Naughty Blonde likes two way spanking, <laughs> busty 18 year old madam. <laughs> He's um, one that kind of added on a wee bit later, flaming groovies and the cramps, and like you know, but okay. I'll show you what's inside us. But it's still there, it's all there, the old original tambourine, like you know. Let's see, I've got the mask here, where's Luxie's Muffy? I think we've got Luxie. This is Lux Interior's Muffy as well, yep, still in here, eh? This is Blag from Luxie's Mouth. One night in Leeds during psychotic reaction. This was the original movie of Lux Interior. Wee bit bash as you can see. What? Still blows beautiful man eye, you know. So that's ah. a great mem- piece of memorabilia from Lux here, man eye. That's incredible. I've got something like, you know, I I just wish I'd kept his PVC top now as well. I ripped, ripped off his back. <laughs> and bloody Manchester has the end. I ended up twirling it about and just slinging into the crowd, you know. This is one of the casualties, probably, right. of the old early primal screen days. I kept that one, like, you know. Okay. That was a mask, my Johnny Thunder's mask, which I used to wear on stage now and again, you know. So, still got that here. But that's the old original tambourine here, you know. So, uh, that is one beast of a tambourine. Yeah, it really is. I mean, it is metal, as you can see there, Peter. Eh? Feel that. that is- you that's know. not as heavy as I was expecting. That's right, not harmful, it's been great. Uh, wow. That's, that's humble. See, I'm getting whacked half your wrist every day. Yes, yeah, see, <laughs> oh, yeah, wow. you some injuries, didn't well, you? Well, that yeah. was it. I had to end up wearing leather gloves as well, like a bit of rubber, you know, put in here, like, because I had to constantly put in there to do it here, so I was getting a really numb wrist, yeah. you know, with the constant bashing, you know, but it's a, it's a piece of art, really, isn't it? It is. It really is. It's a neat instrument, isn't it, eh? And the fact that they built a case to go with it, you know, 
Paul Hart meant serious business here when we came to Tambourines, you know. Do you think the cramps are the best band you've ever seen? Yeah, without a doubt, aye, yeah, definitely. The Cramps and The Clash were the two most exciting bands, aye, without a doubt, aye. I mean, The Clash, when I first seen them, I mean, I hadn't seen many bands, but then I'd probably just seen Dr. Feelgood, The Stranglers, The Jam, Boomtown Rats. But holy shit, when I seen The Clash, man, those guys practically exploded on stage. Yeah. It was just the most phenomenal sight you've ever seen, man, you know. And, and this is this is 1978, it was at Apollo. And before then, you actually had the Coventry Special supporting them on the same night. This is before Gangsters, about a year later. And after them, you had a band called Suicide. And they just blew everyone's tits and minds to pieces. They really did. I mean, I would say 80% of the place hated them, despised this band, Suicide. Mm -hmm. Because they were electronic, it was only two guys. And they kept ranting and raving. Me and you were on the same side. They're like, no, you're not. And you go, mate, take another bottle. And I'm just standing there, golf, something like that. Who in the fuck is this band Suicide? I've never ever heard of these guys, but I thought, I'm going to check these guys out tomorrow and listen, like, you know, I went to listen and just bought a 12 inch single, Shireen, remember, and I'm thinking, wow, what a sound that was, you know. But everyone was there for the clash, obviously, yeah. like, you know, and they were all in the front, we were all just looking about and thinking, this is it, no, this is a moment, you know, this is what we're into music for, you know. Just seeing everyone jumping place was getting totally wrecked of course you know eh? and just you know class flying off stage you know bouncers fighting with the punters you know it's just probably the most chaotic wildest rock and roll gig I've ever been to you know so obviously that clash gig was the one then after that just loads of cramps gigs were just like mind blowing they really were man live you know and, and they're especially in like Brian Gregory phase I think they were just the best you know eh? you know yeah. then you had the Kid Congo phase and then you had Fur and we all say Candy Del Mar right up to Chopper and all that, you know. So he just went through all these different phases, but it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and the places got bigger, you know. Mm -hmm. You kind of lost a wee bit of that kind of momentum and the kind of whites of Lux's eyes. Yeah, you can you know? steal so, his uh, instruments anymore. Well, that was it. I couldn't grab that <laughs> with the half him, you know what I mean? By the time it got to 87, definitely, man. Eh? So, uh, yeah. Okay, well, Jukes, thanks very much. Right, I yeah. really appreciated it. No and, problem, um, man. People should definitely buy your book because it's, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh -huh. It's a joy to behold. Uh -huh. Every page is right, an yeah. absolute belter. Right, good. Uh. So well, it's good. Well done for writing it. Right, uh, well, it took a wee bit of research, you know, a wee bit of time. It took about 20 years. Finally, get round to doing it, you know. So uh, I'm glad I've done it myself, really. And it's getting a monkey off your back, you know. It's quite cathartic, yeah. to tell you the truth, you know. Definitely. But I hope people do enjoy it because it is a wee flashback to a certain time period as you say and it doesn't just involve Primal Scream which I quite like because mm -hmm. I was mostly hanging out in a flat in Byers Road with lots of other people and I tried to bring them into the story as well because yeah. they're quite important as well the people behind the scenes so called because they lead as, as much exciting lives as Bobby Gillespie you know what I mean as far as I'm concerned you know mm. these are my pals as well at the time you know like Billy and Grant next door and the two Pauls in the flat you know so I was probably hanging out more with them Probably from 1985 onwards, you know, definitely, yeah. But uh, it was good to meet people, you know, and go on that roller coaster ride and trip, but it all had to end in it at some point, you know. Definitely. But uh, it was no plan, that's the thing. It all just fizzled out for me personally, you know. Uh, the fun had gone. Not bad for tambourine, man. I know, that's it. Three years. <laughs> Magic. Thanks very okay, much. Okay, right, Peter, right, thanks a lot, mate. Cheers, it. Right.